Hey, we're jumping in. Um, have you guys ever noticed that most things we buy come with a warning sticker on them? Now, most of us don't read those. Uh, especially like if you live a wild and crazy life like Matt Matson uh, or Josh here. You know that literally everything created is down there. I mean, it has caused growth infection in the state of California. Everything. Yeah. So, hey, I wanted to look at some funny warning labels. Um, so, this first one uh, is on a wheelbarrow. Uh, it says, not intended for highway use. That's good to know. How about this next one? Remove child before folding. Um, no, I have not almost folded my child in one of these, but like, sometimes you just forget there's stuff in there. Next! Oh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, on some puppy medicine, may cause drowsiness, use care when operating a car, because puppies obviously drive. Who took their puppy medicine? Right? Next! Um, caution! Do not iron while wearing shirt. That one's, that's important. Please do not do that. Uh, next one. This product is not intended for use as a dental drill. You know, when you're like a carpenter full time, but you got a side hustle taking care of people's teeth. <laughs> Next. Oh, do not use while sleeping. What? For those of you who multitask. Next. How do you not feel the heat? That's what I want. Next. Yeah, oh, this is my favorite. I promise you not carry burritos. Um, look, I don't know who tried to like stop the Chipotle man and be like, yo bro, you got any burritos? No, I don't carry any burritos on me. And you know someone's like, well, why not? Right? Like, like why would you carry a burger or um, a sandwich? As funny as these are, like, you have to think like, there's a reason for these warning labels. Right? Like, there's a reason someone actually did something that required a warning label like this. Um, I don't know, man, it's not something we usually think about, but like, once you see it, you can't unsee it anymore, can you? And that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about this series on injustice. It's called Do Something. And in our first week, we kind of def simply defined justice as something that is right, fair, equal, giving someone what they're due. Um, we said that injustice then would be the opposite, something that is unfair, something that is not right, something that is not equal. Uh, and so in our first week, we talked about, man, a lot of us want to do something about injustice, but we can't just like go off and run out and do something without actually seeing and kind of learning about it and figuring out what's the best way to help. Um, so we got to open our eyes. We got to become aware to the needs around us. Last week, we looked at a message from Dr. Thaddeus Williams speaking about the differences between biblical social justice and cultural social justice. What we call social justice A versus social justice B. And I don't know about you guys, but I find that distinction really helpful. I know I've been referencing this book each week, but I finally finished it because I was in quarantine this week. So I had a lot of extra time on my hands. Um, man, this book, this is necessary. Like, if you want to develop some good thoughts on thinking through injustice in a biblical way, how to respond, how to figure out what are some of the things culture tells us that aren't necessarily true. Um, this dude is like, look, there is injustice. It is around us. Some of the messages we get aren't totally accurate. So super helpful, super helpful. Um, but you know what? The, like these warning labels, there's a risk to learning about injustice. Because when you, when you pull the lid back on injustice and you begin to see it, you can't just walk away. There's this warning label that says, warning might actually cause you to do something. Right? Like, to care, to see a little differently. So here's what I mean. Seeing injustice can leave us with a lot of questions because, um, well, like both about the injustice itself and for those of us who are Christians, uh, we have questions then about the God who we follow, right? Isn't God big enough to handle this? God, you're bigger than I thought you were, but what are you doing, right? So we wonder things like, we see the injustice, we wonder things like, why, why would someone say that? How can someone treat someone else that way? What makes this stuff happen? Why, why do we see the injustice? Why do we see these needs? Why do we see oppression? And why isn't anyone doing something about it? If you've been in church any amount of time, and you've been thinking about this, you might be wondering, where is God, and why doesn't he seem to be doing anything about that? Now, some of you are like, I can't believe you just said that church. Like, we're not supposed to question God. Um, like, where's the lightning? Right? Um, you know, because like he's God and he just does what he wants, right? That's part of being sovereign. Like he chooses. Um, maybe you're like, 
Yeah, where's God and what's he doing? That's the question I keep asking. Like, what, what is going on and where is he, when is, when is he going to move? Maybe this is the reason you or maybe some of your friends are still on the fence about this Jesus thing. Because you're like, okay, um, you're following Jesus. And um, it's hard to imagine, though, being a Jesus follower when this Jesus guy doesn't seem to be doing something about the brokenness we see in our world. Now, before you think I'm a heretic, I don't actually believe God is doing nothing. But it is the question that comes up sometimes. And some of you guys, I know just from our first week, you guys were asking this question in small groups. Um, why is there evil? Why is there injustice? Why is there still suffering? If God is so good and he's so powerful, what's he doing? If you've ever wondered that question, gold star. Like, that's a good question to ask. Um, but don't think you can just ask the question and walk away. Because there's more to the story. Wait, that was our last series. It's time to do something. That's our this year, right? Okay, so look, no matter what the world looks like right now, no matter how crazy your life looks like right now, we do believe in a God who is bigger than we can even imagine. And he's big enough to handle our questions, even the difficult ones. And people from the beginning of time have been asking this question, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? God, when are, when are we going to see it? Why do we keep asking this question? Well, one, because the problem hasn't been resolved yet. And two, because I think it bothers us. Like, I haven't met anyone who is, like, pro-injustice. Like, yeah, injustice! <laughs> Go! Woo! Like, if you ask, I just snorted. It's funny. Um, but look, we have topics, of, when you have conversations about justice, everyone's like, yeah, we want to do the right thing. We want to fix the problem. We want to see it resolved, right? Like, I don't see anyone going like, yeah, down with justice. Really corrupt mob bosses, maybe. I don't know any person like anything else. But it bothers us. And so we ask the question, how can a good God allow things like this? Bullying, human trafficking, prejudice, poverty, abuse, racism, the list goes on. Why does it still happen? I'm really glad that we don't have to guess when we ask that question. Like, well, what is the answer? Well, actually, the Bible tells us what God is doing. So we're going to look at a little bit of, uh, of that tonight. Um, we don't have to wonder, uh, what is God like? Does he really care? Because Jesus is the visible representation of God. So if we want to know what God is like, all we have to do is look at Jesus. Jesus says, I come from the Father. Paul said about Jesus, Jesus is the physical uh, image of the invisible God. Like, if you want to know what God is like, and if he really cares about something, look at Jesus. Look at what Jesus did, and look at what Jesus taught. So tonight we're in Matthew. Matthew 9. If you got your Bibles, turn there. If you don't have your Bibles, why not? Three, use your phone, something. But go there with me. Um, and the book of Matthew, written by one of Jesus' closest followers, whose name was? Josh. Um, <laughs> it was Matthew. Some, some, sometimes uh, the Bible calls him Levi, um, and that's okay. Um, he was known by two different names. And, and he's just one of Jesus' disciples. He's a close follower of Jesus. And what did he do? He's just like, I'm just going to write down what I saw. I want to tell you about this Jesus guy, because I think Jesus mattered a lot to Matthew. If you don't know Matthew, he was a tax collector which means he was employed by Rome, the governing oppressor of the day. We can use those terms. Right? Rome was kind of brutal. They weren't very nice. They conquered the world and was like, uh, we basically rule you now. And so Matthew, being a tax collector, was employed by Rome. So his own Jewish people hated him because he was working for the enemy and not only collecting money, but extorting people. He was taking more. Uh, he was lining his pockets. Um, and so while everyone else looked at Matthew and said, we don't want anything to do with you. Jesus finds Matthew at his tax booth one day and says, Matthew, come follow me. And Matthew does. And his life is transformed because he has this encounter with following Jesus. But here's what Matthew said in chapter 9, verse 35. He says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages in that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. So Jesus was teaching, he was healing, and he's helping people as he shares the message of what God's kingdom is really like. Uh, so obviously we're jumping into a story here. If we were to backtrack, uh, starting in like chapter 5, Jesus is preaching, he's got the Sermon on the Mount. In that sermon, he's talking about being things like salt and light. What does it look like to be evidence of a Jesus follower in the world we live? He talks about anger, and in your anger, don't sin. He talks about not taking revenge. He talks about loving your enemies. Pretty radical stuff, right? Like, none of us like those ideas. He talks about giving to the needy, 
prayer and fasting. He talks about not condemning others. Some of your translations might say judging. It's where we get the, don't judge me. God says you can't judge me. God was talking about condemnation. Let's separate that out of it. He was talking about the golden rule. Treat other people like you want to be treated. He taught about, if you want to know what a disciple is really like, you know it by their fruit. Not just by what they say they believe, but how they live and act. And he taught about building your life upon the surest, most solid foundation that is the word of God. So Jesus taught a lot about like some really good stuff. How do you live as a Christ follower in your world? How do you care for the needy? Things that Christians should do. But he didn't just talk about it. He went and he did it. Because from there, he goes and he heals. Like we have all of like chapter 8, chapter 9, and like he's healing people. Um, so like Jesus is talking about some pretty tough stuff. How do, you, how do you deal with people you don't like? How do you care for the poor and needy? Like some of these are injustice issues. But uh, the point I want to make is that everywhere Jesus went, he taught about the spiritual need that is you need salvation, you need the kingdom of God, and he gave evidence to how much he cared by healing people, by taking care of the sick. Essentially, people who were outcasts in their, like if you were sick with leprosy, well, you have to leave your family and go live outside the city. Um, if you have a um, physical limitation, a handicap, those kind of things, well, good luck. We're going to leave you here by this pool, and maybe we'll give you some leftover food, but we're not taking care of you. So, like, you see, Jesus interacts with the, the lowly, the outcasts, the people who were not taken care of. Like, right, that is an injustice. But I want you to take note of the most important verse, part of, of, of this verse in verse 35. It says, Jesus was teaching and announcing the good news of the kingdom of God. What we have to realize about the way Jesus did things is everywhere he went, he's teaching the good news of the kingdom. Now, sometimes we call this the gospel. Uh, and you might get confused because you're like, wait, I thought the gospel was Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. And like, well, we know that now. But like, Jesus hadn't died at this point. I don't know if any of you picked up on that. He's still very much alive. So what is this gospel? What's the good news Jesus is talking about? If he hasn't died and come back to life yet. Anyone got an idea? What he's getting at is that salvation has come. And that it has come in Jesus. Right? People for thousands of years have been anticipating a Messiah. Someone who would free them. Yes, from their sin. And they had this other understanding of like, well, maybe also from Rome or whoever like the tyranny is. Um... Jesus is always announcing salvation, like the kingdom of God, and caring for people. Caring for people, helping the needy, fighting injustice, like, it always flows out of the gospel first. So, like, in this idea of, man, we want to do something, we can't forget that our do something has to be connected with the good news of Jesus. That's the way Jesus always did it. And why is that so important? Um, because as we talk about what is just and unjust, right and wrong, we have to recognize that somewhere there actually has to be a standard of what right and wrong is. So God, in his sovereignty, his omnipotence, right, you and I are guilty sinners. If we were to stand in a courtroom before God, the judgment for us is guilty. It would be unjust for us to just get a free pass. God makes us just by providing Jesus who takes our sin, takes our punishment upon himself on the cross, right? That is the good work of Jesus, um, so that we can have a verdict that says, not guilty. So God is the ultimate standard for justice, right? The whole courtroom analogy, I think, helps us understand justice. But then our, our, our justice efforts have to flow from that. We recognize justice and injustice because we begin to understand God and who he is, what he's like, and what he demands. Um, so our response for injustice always has to come out of the good news of Jesus. Matthew continues, verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on that. Underline it, circle it, double highlight it. Had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. Some of your translations might say harassed. Like sheep without a shepherd. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, the people who Jesus cares deeply about are confused and helpless Harassed. Who's, who's harassing them? Who's confusing them? Why are they helpless? Um, we could provide a number of answers that are all kind of flesh out this picture. Um, well, let's first just say like Satan 
is harassing and confusing them, right? Like, one of Satan's ultimate objectives is to confuse us and pull us away from Jesus, like, right? That's, that's how he wins. He does that through various means. Sometimes he keeps us too busy to follow God. Sometimes he tells us lies that, like, your sin, your guilt is too big. Uh, sometimes he tells us things like, God doesn't actually care. Sometimes he goes so far as to be like, God doesn't exist. He can't trust anything. Like, like, right? So, um, the Pharisees are confusing them because the Pharisees, uh, who were the religious leaders of the day, um, were putting unjust um, restrictions and rules that, like, they didn't even want to follow themselves. They were pretty hypocritical, and Jesus calls them out for it. Um, and so, as the Jewish people are trying to figure out how do I follow God and what does it look like, and Jesus has this new message, there is a lot of confusion. Um, there is a lot of of of, of helplessness. Um, and the helplessness is because, like, well, we can't save ourselves. How do we follow God? All the rules and restrictions seem too big. Um, so they're like sheep without a shepherd. But look at what Jesus models for us. What is God really like when it comes to the people he cares about, when it comes to the needy, when it comes to things like injustice? First, Jesus saw. It says Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion. He saw the hurt. He saw the confusion. He saw the spiritual brokenness. Now, I don't know if you've picked up on it yet, but this isn't actually a passage about injustice. We'll get to that in a second here. Um, but this isn't a passage about injustice. Um, this is a passage about Jesus being on mission and sharing the good news. And because he's sharing the good news, he's also caring about people. So Jesus saw it. He sees the injustice. He sees the hurt. He sees the brokenness. Um, and when Jesus saw it, it says he cared. Jesus cared. That's what compassion is. So if you've ever wondered, like, what is God's approach? What does God think about injustice? We can look at Jesus and say, Jesus cares. Isaiah 61, 8, Old Testament prophet Isaiah says, For I, the Lord, love justice. Okay, so God, you tell us you love justice, and we have your word saying that you care about the poor, the needy, the oppressed. But God, what are you doing? Where's the evidence? What do we see? Why don't you do something? Why don't, why don't you just wave a magic wand and make all the injustice disappear? Can you get rid of all the hurt? Can you get rid of all the suffering? I think Matthew gives us a clue to what God is doing in the next few verses. And Paul picks up on it later in the New Testament as well. Um, Jesus continues. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now, I don't think about harvesting a lot because I don't live on a farm. Some of you guys do. So you might think about it more than, than the rest of us. But Jesus is talking to an agricultural people. They're harvesting, like part of their just daily sustenance is what gets planted and what gets harvested. Um, right? So they talk about it a lot. It's not weird to them to use this kind of illustration. Uh, but what is Jesus getting at here? The harvest is a lot of work, isn't it? Like, it is a lot of work to bring in the harvest and bring it in on time. So Jesus is saying, I see the people. I care about the people. There's a great need, and there's a lot of work to do. So let's get to work. But what is Jesus' solution to the work that needs to be done? It's not the solution we often pursue first. Jesus' solution is twofold. He says, pray and send. Prayer reminds us that you and I are not sufficient for the task ahead. We have to rely on someone else. You and I cannot do the work alone. Jesus even said it, um, in, in, later in John, he says, uh, the, the poor and needy you'll always have, but you won't have me much longer. Jesus recognizes like these issues are not things that are just going to go away. So the need is huge. We are not sufficient for the task ahead, but God is. Prayer reminds us also that it's not our mission. As much as we care about the needs in the world around us, as much as we care about the injustices we see in our newsfeed, we're not the first ones to see it. And we're not the first ones to do something about it. So it's not our mission. It's actually God's mission. He is already working. Notice that Jesus says the harvest and the fields belong to God. We'll talk a little bit about this a little bit uh, more next week as we talk about, like, Pursuing right and pursuing justice is, is a never-ending endeavor. Um, so that's part of Jesus' solution is prayer. But then the second part is send. Send reminds us that there is a response that is needed. And we are the sent ones. 
John 17, 18, Jesus is praying and he says, as you, God, Father, have sent me into the world, so I am sending them. And again in John 20, verse 21, Jesus says, peace be with you. He's talking to his disciples, his followers. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Paul picks up on this later in the New Testament. He talks about us being Christ's ambassadors, carrying the good news, carrying this message. He tells us we're also to do good, to be agents of reconciliation, healing relationships person to person and person to God, and to care for the needy. So this prayer for sent ones, we can easily misunderstand it and be like, well, this is a prayer for other people to be sent. Jesus isn't talking about me. So God, let me just pray that you would send someone else, but not me, because I'm busy, I've got stuff to do. But if you would just pray and raise up some other workers, that'd be great. Jesus does not let us off the hook that easily. It's not just about praying for others to be sent. This implies that we are also the sent ones. Jesus says there's so much work to be done. If you're joining me on my mission, if you consider yourself a Christ follower, this is your mission too. And it's not just about caring about injustice. Notice we said it always stems from the gospel first. Go with the gospel, also meet physical needs. Do it just like Jesus did. Um, so we're reminded of our calling in this invitation, our calling to follow Jesus and to join in what he's doing and to invite others in as well because we can't do it alone. We need to be fully relying on God, but we also need others to join in what is going on. Remember, this work flows out of the gospel. It does not take the place of the gospel. It does not become more important than the gospel. The importance of our mission is heightened because we understand the gospel and people knowing God is so incredibly valuable. So um, let's bring this down. Let's make it personal. Let's talk about application for a couple seconds. Um, let's make it personal. What if... God has planned to do something about injustice, and what if you and I are part of that plan? What if, like, in all of our questioning of God, what are you doing? What if he actually has a plan, and he is doing something, and you and I are actually part of that plan? What if the miracle Jesus has in mind to uh, care and respond with compassion uh, isn't just waving a magic wand and making it go away, but instead is inviting us to join him in the work he's doing. What if it's us joining him in the things he already cares about? What if the plan is when we do that, we become more like him? He grows us. He shapes us. He transforms us. I think that's the goal. And here's why. Because later on, we talk about Paul a lot, but in um, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul, his life was radically changed by Jesus. He wrote the letters to the early church talking about what it is to be a Christian and follow Christ. He tells us, all of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is part of it. Paul uses this metaphor, this imagery of the body, which is made up of individual parts. And hopefully you guys will dig into this a little bit more in small group tonight, of what it looks like to be gifted and have passions and burdens and actually do something. Um, and even though the body seems like my ear functions independent of my toe, because I don't want to put toe on my ear, that doesn't make sense. But I don't really need like my ear to walk, and I don't need my toes to hear. But in Paul's illustration, he says, your body is made up of these intricate parts, and you can't say one is better than the other, and they all work together. And so the same way, in the same way, God designed us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to be the church, to be this body of Christ, to work together, to help one another out, and be a light to the world around us. So when we're talking about injustice, it's not that God doesn't care. It's that God is actually caring so much that he calls us, you and I, his church, to be his hands and feet here on earth. God, where are you and what are you doing? He says, I made you, didn't I? I called you, didn't I? God is doing something about injustice. God is doing something about racial injustice through us. God is doing something about violence towards women, and the plan involves you and I. God is doing something about sex trafficking, hunger, poverty, abuse, bullying, modern-day slavery, and all the other immense amount of injustices that we see in our newsfeed. That sounds heavy. But the light is that God is doing something, and he calls us and he invites us. We get to be part of that. So the question is, are, are, are you going to join in to what he's already doing? 
And if so, where do we start? Maybe it's time to rethink a few things. First thing we can rethink. Rethink what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Because if you have bought into the idea that your faith is just about believing in God, coming to church, singing a few songs, and going home on Sunday night, then we're missing such a big part of our faith. God didn't design us for a Sunday faith. He designed us for an everyday faith. So following him means we start to see the world like he sees it. Jesus, give me eyes to see the world the way you see it. Jesus, give me a heart that cares about the world the way you care about it. Jesus, give me an attitude that treats people the way you treat them. Then we can begin to do something about the brokenness we see in our world. Because we know what Jesus is like. And we know what he's calling us to do. Second thing you can rethink. Rethink how God sees people. In our world today, it is so easy to look online and to think that maybe God doesn't care about some people. We, we villainize a lot of people. We demonize a lot of people. Dr. Williams talked about that last week. We're like, we just make other people out to be demons and monsters. And when we do that, like our care and compassion for those people goes way down. Rethink the way God sees people. People are not our enemies. Scripture tells us that our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other people. It's about the powers and forces uh, working behind the scenes, the spirituality that does sometimes manifest itself in people and in systems. But people are not our enemy. People are what God loves. So rethink how you see people. Rethink how you think God sees people. Ask him to make it clear. God, you care about people. You care about their hurts. You care about the obstacles uh, that they face. God, help me to care about them the same way that you do. Third thing you can rethink, rethink your responsibility. Maybe you thought that like responding to injustice isn't for you. Um, I think we've made a pretty good case over the past few weeks that responding to injustice isn't optional in the same way that so many other parts of our Bible are not optional. It's, it's a pretty clear command, just like love your neighbor, uh, just like tell the truth, just like any of the other commands. It doesn't, it's not more important than the gospel. It's because we believe the gospel. Um, so begin to rethink, man, what's your approach to injustice? What's, what's your responsibility? And I'm not saying you have to care about everyone because like that's just overwhelming. But if God has placed something on your heart, do something. Like learn about it, figure out what you can do, figure out who's already working and doing something about it and join in. So maybe, maybe the question all along, you know, the question we started with is God, where are you and what are you doing? Maybe that's the wrong question. So instead of asking, where is God? Maybe the question needs to be, where am I? God, you invite me into this mission. Because I believe you, because I trust the gospel, because I know the good news of following Jesus, I want to share that with others, but I also want to help the actual problems in this world too, just like Jesus did. He, he encountered the physical and the spiritual, and he, he did both. Um, I think the quote goes back to Theodore Roosevelt. He's attributed with it. But it goes something along the lines of, um, people won't care what you know until they know what you, that you care. Um, and it's the idea of, like, um, early missionaries learned this, right? They thought, hey, if I could just go to a tribe and preach the gospel, like, that's all I have to do. And then they realized, well, if I want to make an actual impact, I need to, like, get my hands dirty with people. I need to live with them. I need to laugh with them and cry with them. And I need to show them that I actually care about their physical self so that they understand where this care comes from. It comes from the recognition that I've been extravagantly loved by God and I want you to be extravagantly loved by him too. So where am I? Choose to be part of what God is already doing in the world. Ask him to show you, man, what, where, where am I supposed to work? What am I supposed to do? How do I join in? A couple indicators that might help you figure that out. And then we'll go to small groups. What do you see that breaks your heart? Is there something that, like, man, when you see it, it just, like, crushes you? You're just like, man, I wish someone would do something about that. Well, that someone is you. So now you have to figure out how do I join in and do something. So from there, the second thing you can do is step up, serve, give your time, your energy, maybe your money. But take the skills, take the personality God has wired you with, take the giftedness he's given you, your strengths, your intellect, all that stuff, and use it. 
use it in a way that helps. Um, Matthew 5, Jesus is teaching, and he says um, that we're, we're, we're a city on a hill, a light for the world to see. Um, and he says, um, let your good deeds be known so that when non-believers see it, they can't help but recognize it comes from your Father in heaven. So step up, serve, be a light. And third thing, like, man, if you've got something that really burns you, figure out who's already working in that area. Who's doing something? Where can I join in? And if no one's doing something, step up. Make an organization. Uh, one of the coolest stories I heard, it's a while back, but Jeff Foxworthy, if you guys know him, he's like a famous comedian. His uh, daughter had learned about his need, and I don't remember in which area of the world it was, but malaria is a big problem in a lot of parts of the world. And so she started an organization uh, called Bite Back, and it was, it's kind of funny because mosquitoes bite you, but if you want to bite them back, right? So her organization was all about getting mosquito nets to people who needed them so that they could sleep well at night and not be worried about getting bit by them. Like something so simple. But she did that as a teenager. Don't let anyone tell you you can't. Go for it. If God has burdened you with it and you feel he's calling you to it, man, let's, let's go for it. So, hey, um, there's a lot to unpack tonight. So we're going we're gonna to go to small groups. And in small groups, we're going to talk more about what are the needs you see in the world around us. What burdens does God place on your heart? Um, we're going to look a little bit more at 1 Corinthians, where Paul says we're all wired as the body of Christ. And each of us performing the different roles that God has given us um, just brings the body of Christ in this complete picture of the way God designed it. So, man, some really exciting stuff there. Uh, and then next week, we're going to continue. We're going to wrap the series up. So um, let's pray. We'll go to groups. God, um, thank you that we don't have to wonder what you're like and if you really care. So, God, we can look to Jesus to see um, he did care. He cared immensely. He wanted to bring the good news, the hope, the salvation uh, of salvation, the good news that the kingdom of God is here and we can be freed from sin. And he also cared enough to, to take care of the physical needs, to heal people, um, and, and, and to care for the needy and those who were um, on, on the fringes of society. And so God, as, as we respond to injustice, as we look at the needs around us, it might be joining in a 6K for clean water. It might be packing shoeboxes for kids around the world so they can hear the good news of Jesus and celebrate Christmas. It might be right down the street at the Women's Care Center to help girls and women who are trying to figure out, do I keep my baby or not? It might be at the neighborhood center where we're trying to figure out, man, man, what does poverty look like and how do we help in our community? God, whenever you're burdening with us, I pray that we would seek you first, that you would guide us, direct us, equip us, call us to be part of the mission, to be part of the work you're already doing. God, thank you that you're a good God. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you're doing something. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.